we are having Kurt Witcher speak about Preservation Primer Part One, the basics of preserving our physical artifacts. And Kurt, I think we're ready for you to get started. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. And welcome to everyone. As Sarah articulated, we're always always happy when our friends from uh, across the country and the world uh, take some time out to, to join us. Um, this afternoon's program and Thursday evening's program are really about us getting serious in a fun way about preserving our family history, both the artifacts that evidence that history, and we'll talk about a lot of different things today, and then on Thursday more, what we can do to preserve living memory, right? And what we can do to uh, preserve our understanding, our research, our interpretation of documents and records and stories uh, so that they truly can live on for our grandchildren's grandchildren. I'm gonna share my screen in a moment. I will turn my camera off for a, a, a cleaner, easier view for, for all of you. And as Sarah said, we hope to have some time at the end of the session for some questions and answers. Um, I want to sort of quasi apologize for the handout because it's kind of heavy, heavy meaning it's kind of long and it's like, oh my gosh, am I going to have to like read through all of this? Uh, no. Um, I try to make my handouts evergreen, which means they don't necessarily follow my slides. I know some might find that aggravating, Today, they'll follow pretty closely my slides, but I really would like that handout to be something you can file away since you're receiving it electronically. You can put in a little file on your computer. You can print it out if that's what you'd like to do, but things that you can refer back to uh, periodically when preservation items come up. If I can give you a quick tip toward the end of the handout, there are a number of preservation online places where you can get supplies, preservation shops, et cetera. Oh my goodness, I could lose my entire paycheck uh, on just a few of those sites. There's also some links to some really great preservation advice, which we're just not gonna have time to get into that level of detail. This is kind of an everyday person's view of how you can do things easily economically, safely, wisely uh, to preserve our physical artifacts that evidence our ancestors' lives. So hand out a little heavy, and some of the slides are a little heavy. I think you will see again this afternoon that I failed PowerPoint 101 because my slides have way too many words on them, but we're going to talk our way through, and I hope that we'll pick up some good tips and uh, have an enjoyable time. So preservation primer part one, as Sarah mentioned, um, in a way what we do is kind of awesome, right? Uh, we have history, our history in our hands. So that's kind of an awesome responsibility, whether it's our research notes, whether it's heirlooms that have been passed on through just one generation or five or six generations, whether it's a diary or a day book that came from great greats uh, on a collateral line, we're holding history in our hands, the documents and the artifacts. So there's kind of a special burden on us. We know how we feel about those items. Are we going to take the time, do some common sense things, not necessarily always expensive things, but common sense things to make sure that our great-grandchildren's great-grandchildren, whom we will never meet, will be able to enjoy and benefit from and feel that same sense of closeness uh, to our stories and to our ancestors that we feel. It's kind of an awesome responsibility and it. I think it behooves us to spend a little bit of time uh, and attention. As I did with the handout, so too with my slides, I wanna start with some definitions because you hear a lot of things tossed around. This is really pedestrian, so I don't mean to insult anyone, but I just wanna make sure we're all at the foundation. So when we're thinking about two-dimensional items, and we'll talk about some three-dimensional items briefly, but when we're thinking two-dimensional paper, photographs, books, acid is commonly found in all of them. It's part of what makes a number of those items. Um, acid makes the surface of paper better for writing, drawing, coloring, photocopying, ink affixes better, toner affixes better, toner can be melted in better when you're going to the heat rollers on a copier or a printer. So there's all kinds of reasons why acid is used and it's really, um, 
everywhere. And it's really not good for long-term storage of documents. Today, in the 21st century, in 2022, we can get acid-free paper almost as cheaply as we can get acetic paper. So when we're making purchasing decisions at office supply places, when we're making other decisions about how we're going to store things, on what are we going to print, um, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Should I go more for acid-free than just regular common copier paper, scanner paper, et cetera. Uh, the problem, as you see there in red, is, is that acid gradually breaks down the paper. Um, acid uh, turns your paper into kind of a mini scientific experiment, if you will. It's constantly working on degrading the paper. And what happens eventually is it becomes brittle over time and discolors and in the right conditions, which are the wrong preservation conditions, uh, it will turn your paper to dust. It will take many years to do that, but it won't take as long as you think if you have terrible environmental conditions for acid really to get on a roll and do some very, very serious damage. Um, Acid-free materials are ones that have a neutral or a basic pH value. So other terms that we can find online in office supply places um, and office supply websites, uh, Acid-free conservation grade typically means acid-free and buffered paper, buffered so that it's kind of impervious to other acid attacks from acetic materials that it might be nearby stored next to. Uh, archival grade or museum grade. Um, no, there's nothing special about archival grade, even though I didn't make the A in archival blue, but archival grade, museum grade. So all four of those, acid-free, conservation grade, archival grade, museum grade, tell us that that's a good uh, paper to use to store materials, to print materials, to interleave amongst materials. So um, those are just good basic things for us to know. Now, the symbol that you see over on the right that's also on your handout, uh, no, that's not Facebook's new logo, uh, Meta. That's the symbol way before Facebook was even an inkling in someone's mind that was the international symbol for pH neutral acid free uh, materials. So, no, we're not channeling Zuckerberg or, or Facebook, uh, Facebook, I should say, this afternoon. So, pH neutral is when a substance is neither acetic or base or alkaline. Some of you may now start having little nightmares about your chemistry classes in K through 12 education. But yeah, some of this chemistry does come to play in our, in our everyday lives. Um, we'll see in just a moment, and it is in your handout, that pH neutral is actually a seven, not a zero on the acetic alkalinity scale, okay? Um, and I'm only pointing that out because a lot of people say, yes, my paper is acid free. It has a value of zero. But as a value of zero, you're, you're, you're going to have some other kinds of problems because it will be too, uh, it'll have too much uh, alkalinity in it. Um, it's best when the materials you use are pH neutral, neither too acetic or alkaline. And there's that chart. So zero, um, I misspoke um, just a second ago. Zero is way up on the acid side, not way down on the alkalinity side. But yeah. It, your document has a pH value of zero, it's on fire. Um, that's right up in the ranks of battery acid. So, uh, but I kind of appreciate this chart because it kind of keeps me in tune with what things are close to pH neutral and what things are really not so good. Um, and some common household things on the right is, is a pretty nice way of remembering some of those things. Don't want to spend too much time on this, but just wanted to give you kind of a heads up what all this is, and you can see this in, in the handout. Uh, buffering is a process through which non-acetic materials are introduced into paper making or container making. And containers can be folders or clamshell boxes or fitted lid boxes. Um, buffering is a process where you're trying to um, make sure that um, acid is not in the material and doesn't have an easy way to transfer into the material that you're saving in, in the box, in the folder. Um, it neutralizes the effects of acid. Lignin, a lot of people don't know about this or when they see it, they just kind of read through it like, uh, I don't know about this, it's not very important, I'm just gonna ignore it. Um, 
lignin kind of like acid in a way. It's a chemical found in wood, papers made from wood byproducts, etc. So lignin kind of makes the paper stronger. So yeah, that's a good thing, except lignin breaks down over time and releases acid. And now we're back into the acid cycle of having the paper turn brown and disintegrating. So when you say, or when you see on advertising something is acid-free, excellent, that it's buffered, even better, that it's lignin-free, really good. So it doesn't have any acid in it, it's buffered against acid, and it doesn't have any lignin in an attempt to make the paper stronger because that, break, that breaks down into acid. So how's that for your chemical scientific lesson for today? Aren't you glad we had a throwback into K through 12 uh, science classes, caring for the history in our hands. Let's, let's talk about some strategy here a little bit. Um, two points I wanna make, and I think they're really important points because again, this is not how we can do things perfect. This is how we can do things easily economically that will really make a meaningful impact on the lives of our artifacts. So the first point is don't let perfection get in the way of progress. My colleagues probably have tired of hearing me say that long ago. Uh, sometimes we can really focus on perfection. We can become discouraged when we don't attain perfection. We can become super discouraged when perfection is too expensive for us and we can't afford perfection. And then we say, ah, there's nothing I can do. I guess this old family Bible, these letters from a century ago, Oh, dear me, I guess they're just relegated to become dust and blow away in the wind someday. Um, no, no, not necessarily. Uh, because we can't do something perfectly doesn't mean there's nothing for us to do. And it doesn't give us an excuse to do nothing, right? So don't let perfection get in the way of progress. The second point was is really important, particularly, particularly for people who are really type A, like want to get things done, want to do it right, have to do it right now. Um, do no harm. So if you remember these two points, you're already well on your way to making meaningful contributions toward preserving your artifacts, two-dimensional, three-dimensional artifacts. Don't focus on perfect, focus on what's possible for you in your situation right now and do no harm. Don't look for the cute, clever, shiny, new, wonderful things. Do no harm. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Don't do anything to your document. Don't place your artifact inside something that is going to harm it or potentially harm it. So do no harm. What does that mean? So let's take a look at a couple slides. So, you know, be intentional. Intentionality is really of great consequence when you want to conserve and preserve your family heirlooms, your family artifacts. Be intentional. Pay attention to the material upon which you place information, paper that you use to write on, print on, et cetera, and where you place your documents and artifacts. Um, we have, and some of you may smile, and my colleagues will definitely smile wide. Uh, we have, on more than a few occasions, had family papers and photographs, and even back in the day, three and a half inch floppy disks donated to us in, of all things, yard waste and leaf recycling bags. That's not a container which has any intentionality of permanency to it. That's a container that is by design in uh, intended to degrade and fall apart and go back to the earth quickly and easily. So just be intentional. Um, I don't have anything specifically on a slide, but is the attic or the cellar which can be very, very hot in the attic and very, very cold within 12 months. The cellar, which is like almost always humid and filled with critters that aren't paying rent in our houses and domiciles. Is that really the best place? It may be the most convenient place, but pay attention, pay attention. Just that one simple fact of, hey, I'm not gonna store things in the attic or the cellar. I'm gonna put it on the main floor with human beings. So maybe the temperature will stay within a more narrow or precise range. Never engage in a process that cannot be undone. 
So I got some super glue. So I'm going to glue these photographs onto this album paper because, well, Kurt said, you know, acid free was really good. So I have acid free paper and I'm going to use some glue just to super glue these things right on this, on this acid free paper. Well, even if your super glue is acid free, most are not, but you can get acid free glue. Why would you want to do that? Uh, you want to have the possibility that without harming the artifact, you can remove those photographs and put them in a different album or put them in a box or give them to someone or give them to an archive or a repository that will handle them much better than we're able to handle them individually. Um, don't mean to sound too preachy, but never, ever, ever do anything to your family heirlooms, your objects, your documents that cannot be undone. Many people are still so uber fascinated with laminating. Look, I razored my family pages out of the Bible. That makes me cringe immediately. And, and I laminated them. See, I can spill water on them. I can handle them and nothing happens to the paper. Isn't that clever? Isn't that wonderful? No, it is not clever. It is not wonderful. We don't need a shiny surface on something. If you want a shiny surface on your family Bible pages, digitize them and print them on ceramic or on some other plastic and have a shiny surface. And I'm being a little facetious here, but I feel pretty passionately about us being intentional about not doing anything to our documents that can't be undone. And lamination, oh my goodness, we still see all kinds of really neat family heirlooms, whether they're paper uh, or photographs, uh, diaries or photographs that have been laminated, had special pages removed and laminated. You, you typically can't undo laminated pages because essentially the lamination process is melting plastic or a plastic-like material into um, the actual document surface. Now there are ways, and you can Google this, we just don't have time to cover it very well this afternoon. You can encapsulate a document in acid-free mylar, and you can use acid-free tape to seal up the edges, the four edges of the acid-free mylar, making sure you leave breathe holes, sometimes called weep holes, in one or two of the corners because your document needs to breathe. It needs to be some clean air in there for any possible off-gassing that might happen with your document over time. So, but we won't go down that, that path too far, but ne never do anything that can't be undone. I say deploy the CSI approach in determining the best course of action. What do crime scene investigators do? Do they race to a crime scene, scoop up the first shiny object and race back to the lab to evaluate it? No, they kind of approach it. They look around, they do a little exploring, they gather a lot of, pardon use the technical term, stuff, and then they make a decision about what ought to be used. What kind of conclusions can one arrive at? So we should do that same thing when we're investigating. Um, practice using new materials and new techniques on some samples. Um, some, this, this kind of goes in waves. Some get really fascinated with deacidification processes. Well, I'm here to tell you, uh, don't try it if you're not a professional. You can ruin your document spraying Wayto spray on it, trying to deacidify it. Uh, if your document really is on fire, if you've laminated it, and now you can see two years, 10 years later, that the lamination has accelerated the effects of the acid in the paper, and it's turning brown and illegible, digitize it and see if you can't use a program to balance out or to filter out um, some of that brown or dark spots in, in your document. But practice new techniques on a sample or a corner or some obscure place on the document before you actually um, do harm, right? So um, here's just a little more philosophy, small p philosophy. Never be in a hurry when you're repairing a document, when you're putting a document, encapsulating it in mylar, when you're putting it in acid-free folders, when you're removing staples and paper clips from the document. Um, so the first bullet point there, walk, don't run. You know, you'll get there eventually. So much harm is done to our documents when we're in a hurry to do something. If you have a 20 minute job and you wanna do it in five minutes before you go out to Sunday night dinner with your family, stop, don't do it, uh, do something else. Um, check your social media channels, do something. Um, 
The next two points, really important. Remember what grows mold and mildew and why. So when we're storing our documents, you know, water is not our friend typically. Clean distilled water when we're trying to clean something, yes. But moisture in the air around high relative humidity that grows mold and mildew. Remember that. Remember what rusts and why. If we have some family heirlooms that are metallic, that get tarnished, how and why does that happen? That's excessive exposure to environments where the relative humidity is high or whether there's or where there's acid and other particulates in the environment. Uh, so just remember that. Clean circulating air is a good thing. Uh, circulating air that is of the right temperature, not very high or very cold, and that has good relative humidity, not high and not low, um, that's a good thing. Um, cleanliness is next to godliness. The critters that we welcome into our houses because we don't have clean houses, they may not directly degrade our documents, but they may leave, let's just be delicate this afternoon and say droppings behind that have acid and other chemicals in them that will degrade our documents. So how's that for an after lunch thought? And my last bullet point here, cute, cool, and clever in the end typically isn't cute, cool, and clever. So don't jump on every preservation bandwagon. Don't jump on everything that comes along that says, this is a great way. Shadow boxes are wonderful. Put all of your heirlooms in a shadow box. Well, what would be some of the questions that we would ask ourselves if we want to do no harm about a shadow box? Can I get a shadow box at a reasonable additional cost that has UV protection on the glass? Where's that shadow box gonna be? Is it gonna be where it lives in the sun for a part of the day? Um, all those are really important considerations. I've heard many people over my life say, oh, don't worry, Kurt, it's only a few hours of early morning sun. It won't harm the quilt, the picture, the Civil War document, uh, the, the family Bible too much. Well, you might be surprised what, what too much is. So preservation wise, this is what I call the real deal. Maybe this is a little bit of sobriety on a Tuesday afternoon. So stone tablets, carvings, and the like, preserved from wind, rain, and sun, now that can be a deal, will last several thousand years. So let's all go out and get ourselves chunks of stone, have it delivered to our backyard. I'm sure our neighbors and our neighborhood covenances will all permit that. And let's take some chiseling lessons and we'll just chisel everything into stone. Well, no, that's terribly unpractical. But the sobriety of it is because we've seen it, we have evidence of it. We have paintings and carvings on cave walls that are easily many thousands of years old. So that's really the best preservation mechanism that we are aware of. Totally impractical, right? So really not a possibility. pH neutral paper stored in stable environmental conditions. I should have made that red and blinking. Um, stored in stable environmental conditions, which means very little fluctuation in temperature and relative humidity, will last somewhere between 770 years to 1,000. That's not bad. I'm not going to be around in 770 years. Um, the Indiana University, probably 20 years ago now, did a project with Harvard. It did a joint project where they had paper that was made from hemp. So see, there are other purposes for hemp. Um, and they did some accelerating, accelerated testing on it and said that, yep, paper, acid-free paper, hemp-based would easily last a thousand years. Well, not many of us have access to that kind of specialty paper, but this is kind of a hopeful sign, right? pH neutral, stable environmental conditions, pH neutral, cheap environmental conditions. We have control over that. Silver halide microtext, film or fiche, stable conditions, 170 to 225. Some microfilm vendors would argue with this, of course. A microfilm vendor, of course, would argue with this. That's like when you ask a carpet manufacturer, what's the best flooring for an archive? Well, of course, they're going to tell you carpet because that's what carpet manufacturers do, right? So, but 
we'll say 100 to 300 years. So we're how microphone. Electronic media, disks, USB drives, hard drives, whatever's coming next. Will last five to 15 years, we think. But we're not really sure because there's been a lot of failures, right? There's been a lot of failures. There's been a lot of lost data because we're not intentional. So I'm gonna to flip to the next slide here, my three asterisk slide. So well over 12 years ago, this product came on the market and it's still available on a DVD CD-ROM. It's one of those combos, which for me raises a big question because what player are you gonna use it in? You can write things to what looks like a normal DVD and they're guaranteeing it for a thousand years. Well, it's only been around for 12 and the fail rate, it's kind of interesting. It has a less fail rate than regular DVDs and Blu-rays, but it does have a fail rate. So someone, I was reading some reviews just last night, had purchased a pack of 25 thinking, hey, you know, I'll be able to write a lot of data. Well, they were able to write one disc and they only had seven discs left. So they failed that many times. They failed what? 17, 18 times before they got a disk to write. That's problematic. Things will get better. Cloud storage, we don't really know the long-term effects of that. But when we do put things electronically, when we digitize things, and you'll see in the next coming slides that I'm a big advocate of digitizing things, we need to forever and implore our descendants forever to continue to refresh the media. You never have one copy of it, three, four, five copies distributed. I kind of smile to myself when people say, I have backups. I have one on the hard drive on my computer. I have another hard drive in the drawer right next to the computer. And I have a third hard drive on the bookshelves just across the room from the computer. So fire, storm, tornado, theft, you could wipe out all three of those copies at one time. So you don't really have a backup when they're all in the same place. So don't mean to be too sober on a Tuesday afternoon, but you know, this is the lineup. We can't do what's gonna last several thousand years. We can do number two. So maybe we should pay attention to that. And as we're doing electronic media, let's be smart, let's be wise. Let's continually read the reviews. What kind of USB drives? How many of us have been stuck, caught, surprised, shocked with a USB drive that we forgot to back up for the last couple months. And we've been putting all kinds of things on there and it fails. It's like, well, we're gonna take this to get it like restored. It's like, mm, the chances are pretty poor. So so what do, what do you want to do? What do we want to do? Do you wanna preserve the item for future generations? Do you wanna display the physical item? Do you wanna display the virtual item? Do you want to share the item with family and friends at reunions and holiday gatherings? Or do you want to do some of all of that? Probably most of us want to do some of all of that. What our primary focus is for any artifact that will drive what we're going to do with that artifact, right? So let's take some um, more looks on how we can keep things around for many, many, many years. Cleanliness, as we saw on a previous slide, really is next to godliness. Is the item clean? If it's not clean, proceed with what I call this escalation. Knock off the loose dirt, brush off the particles with a soft brush or a soft cloth. Don't need to put anything on it. Some of us are fixated, particularly in this covid -y era. We're going to wash it. We're going to scrub it. And antibacterial soap. We're going to disinfect it. We're going to Virex it. No, stop. How about just distilled water to begin with if we need something. But look here, you don't see any, any liquid yet. Knock off loose dirt, brush off the small particles, sweep even smaller pieces off with, off with a soft cloth. And if you have to try to remove something, use a soft, very soft eraser. So that it will kind of pick away at the dirt and leave. We hope all, if not all, a high percentage of the artifact behind. When you're cleaning things with soap, when you're cleaning things, with, people are fascinated with Tarnex on their brass, on their silver. Well, there's a high probability with Tarnex and all these other cleaning agents that yeah, you're removing the dirt and it looks, 
as the one slide said, cool and cute and clever, and you probably have taken off, and assuredly microscopically, you have taken off part of what you were trying to preserve and clean up. Um, we want to try to stay away from that as, as much as possible. Um, we got this in the genealogy center here years ago. You can see that it's um, if you look closely, the, the hairs on this brush are really, really soft, that they come out all the time. I wish that we could send touch through a Zoom monitor. This is softer than a young child's skin. That's how soft this brush is. You can get all those all the way up to ones that are wire brushes that can take concrete off of concrete, but you want a soft brush to remove things. These are common in art supply stores everywhere. And there's, there's literally hundreds you can choose from online. Determine the acidity of two-dimensional items. Do what you need to do to determine how acidic it is. Uh, check with a chemical pen or instrument or some other process in a discrete location on the item in case it makes a mark or leaves a mark. We want to always be careful when we're putting chemicals on our family artifacts. If you're in doubt and the entity has no artifactual value and it's two dimensional, as, as the header says, transfer it to acid free pH neutral medium. Um, transfer the photograph, transfer the actual paper, the diary, uh, et cetera. Acid just is, is not your friend. Um, how are the items exposed? Sunlight will fade all items for sure. Uh, and typically, sooner than we think. Any ultraviolet light, which is in sunlight, is the culprit, but there are other light sources have ultraviolet light in them as well. Um, a really, really sad story. Um, the library, um, a number of years ago, in the early um, part of the second decade of the 21st century, um, we had some Civil War dresses that the person who loaned them to us for display continued not to pick them up off display. So they sat for 13 months longer than they should have in a display case with a couple of fluorescent bulbs. And the amount of fade on those Civil War period pieces, amazing and not in a good way. Um, so ultraviolet light, not your friend. Uh, take care, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, in placing, hanging, displaying family documents, Bibles, and no early morning sunlight does not necessarily have any less ultraviolet rays than midday or late day sunlight. Uh, it all depends on how much exposure. Um, Two-dimensional items should be stored flat, not like dangling. Um, they should be stored clean. Have we mentioned clean a couple times this afternoon? Um, if of artifactual value and they are acetic, uh, place the items between acetic paper. So oftentimes in the genealogy center, when we have an old letter and we're working through an amazing collection that's taking a long time to work through, uh, one of our colleagues, Kay Spears, is working on just an amazing collection that's many centuries old. And the paper, because it's that old, has a lesser acetic content than paper made today. And we're interleaving a lot between acid-free paper. Put it in an acid-free folder. Store two-dimensional items gently tight upright, vertical, or completely flat. Don't let them slouch or curve. Upright, tight, or flat. So let's take a look at some atrocities that are perpetrated on our two-dimensional items. I'm sure no one listening this afternoon will have done any of this, uh, but tape is not our friend either. And we're, um, I think we're compulsive about making sure that this little inch and a half, two inch newspaper thing remains securely in the middle of this piece of paper. Um, well, you can see uh, what the tape has done to the top and the bottom of that um, newspaper that's pinned, taped, if you will, to that particular piece of paper. Um, and you have masking tape at the top and the bottom. Um, see how the tape is turning a different color as well. So um, amazing what these adhesives can do because they have acid in them. Um, we should stay away from those items. Um, again, we like to keep things organized. I would say organize them by folding an eight and a half by 11 acid-free paper in half and slipping different pages into different acid-free pages 
folded in half. We don't need paper clips, staples. Sometimes our ancestors used straight pins instead of staples or paper clips. We don't need any of that. Uh, they will leave marks and they will degrade our material. So I, I had to share this one with you because you can see where the, the staples have been removed or all that um, rusty looking is. And what did the person do? They replaced the staples with these bright, shiny new paper clips. There's another one hidden back here. Well, what's going to happen over time with these paper clips? They also will rust and they'll leave wonderful rust marks on on our papers, like this rust mark up here from this secretary's book of the Christian Women's Fellowship. Um, what a shame that we have damaged that, the collective we, by using paper clips. Isn't that a beautiful sight? And you can see where the paper clip has actually caused not only discoloration, but some degradation of actually the integrity of the paper that it's being, that's being held together. So. Not the best idea in the world. So papers that aren't stored flat, you can see this one has been folded up several times. Here's a fold, a tear because of folding and unfolding. Here's a fold, another tear. Here's another fold here. Um, notice these lines, these straight lines here. That's probably because some metallic something, a clip or something has been against the paper. This is some impurity where the dark spot is the impurity. It could be the excrement of spiders, silverfish, something else. And notice how it's continuing to degrade the paper around it. This is likely foxing. This is likely foxing where there's just a higher degree of acid content in that part of the paper and it's degrading it quicker than uh, the rest of the paper. So you can see damage from not being careful. Um, if we're not doing things with staples and paper clips and straight pins, we're doing things with rubber bands. Well, heat, and it doesn't have to be like oven heat, just regular heat over time, will make loose springy rubber bands turn hard like tire rubber and bond to the paper. This part of the rubber band has turned hard and bonded to the paper here. This is where it came off of the paper, but brought some of the paper with it. So we damaged the paper in the process. Um, not a great thing. So this is our ball of shame in the Genealogy Center workroom. Uh, these are rubber bands that we have removed from documents, boxes, containers, you name it, containing all kinds of really important items. Notice how the rubber bands have squiggle to them even when they're not around something that typically is evidence that they're already um, turning hard and this ball of rubber bands is about two and a half three inches in diameter and it's hard at its core it could do some damage because it's hardened over time and it's bonded to itself we don't want to do that mildew water and dirt um, so this was a book that was not stored carefully notice all this damage that's been done around the edges some of it degrading because of the humidity the moisture if you will some of it degrading because of things that were attracted to the paper because of the moisture it was a nice good little meal doesn't that look wonderful a close-up of the edges of that book um, a lot of damage done photographs uh, we love to share photographs share copies of photographs uh, if you have original photographs, store those away in a closed environment, meaning a fitted lid, acid-free box. Same thing you would do with uh, negatives. Uh, make copies. Oh my gosh, there's so much cheap technology. We can take pictures of pictures with our smart devices and share them widely, carry them around with us. Uh, we don't have to damage um, originals or near originals. Um, all of us have heard the magnetic photo album. What a hilarious joke that was. There was nothing magnetic about it. It was acid adhesive that kept the photographs adhered to the paper. They weren't magnetized. There was nothing magnetic about it. And look at this magnetic album. That's where the acid was adhesive was trawled onto the paper and brought to market so we could ruin, ruin our documents. 
Um, here's both acid, the adhesives, and moisture got in there. So this is all mold or mildew, or mold and mildew, all this black around the top left. So the photograph has been fading. Um, this, is, this is horrible. Um, another example of some uh, mildew and or mold, some adhesive, acid adhesive, acetic adhesive that has been crawled onto, onto the photo album sheet. Um, brittle plastic here, dirt and exposure. Um, photograph is degrading here, degraded here, um, degraded up top here. Label pasted on top of the acetic cover. So this is kind of a chemical experiment in our midst, not the best thing. Um, just another example of um, dirt and something else that got in this photograph where you see my cursor circling, acetic adhesive here, um, some damage done up here, something has gone through the actual photograph itself. Um, who knows what kind of varmint left that behind. Um, just not a great way to preserve things. Polaroid pictures, you know what Polaroid pictures are? Those are little mini chemical experiments in our midst. If you have a Polaroid picture, that picture, that picture is continuing to develop. It's a mini little chemical experiment right in our midst. If you have any Polaroid pictures, convert them now, scan them now. Um, it's not gonna get any better, it will only get worse. Um, my youngest sister was born right at the peak of Polaroid. So my family took lots of Polaroid pictures. And now they're mostly shades of red and red and red and maybe some green in there. Um, and definition being lost, um, pretty amazing. Um, they're, again, chemical experiments. Um, here's some improvement. They only taped here in the middle and they didn't tape over the picture and they have it covered and they haven't adhered the, the picture necessarily, the paper, I should say, to the photo album, but it's not great. Here is a little better because they've stuck it, placed it in a photo album that has sleeves. You can see here's a square for a picture, here's a square, and then these three squares here have a picture in them. So three empty squares, three squares with pictures, but it's acetic. So it will continue to degrade, degrade the photograph. This, in my opinion, is the best way. You can get these at all kinds of um, uh, craft shops. Look for free floating pages. So there's three photographs here. And if you're not careful, you can shake the photograph album and they would fall out. The whole idea is we're not shaking our containers. We're carefully placing, using, viewing our containers. So the photographs in here are free floating. The paper and the covering, the plastic or mylar is all acid free. So free floating, acid free sleeves. So the sleeves of the pages are acid free. The paper is acid free. Those are the ones I like best because that really fulfills the do no harm. We can undo this. We can shake the page a little bit and all three photographs will come out and we can do something with them. Photographic preservation, I strongly recommend digitizing. Keep negatives and originals in a dry, cool, dark place. Um, remove those magnetic. What a hoot, what a scam they pulled on us calling these magnetic photographs. Uh, reshoot, digitize Polaroid because they're only gonna get worse. They will in their lifetime be un undistinguishable. So we, we wanna do something about that. I'm gonna march pretty quickly through these examples. Um, books and scrapbooks, we're enamored with uh, scrapbooks. We love doing things in scrapbooks. Again, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, let's just please be intentional. Uh, if we're gonna do scrapbooks, I'm not a big fan of scrapbooks because people just throw all kinds of things in there and it makes it impossible to really preserve well. But if you are a fan of scrapbooks, go to a scrapbooking place and look carefully at the acid content, whether it's pH neutral, look at the pages of the scrapbook, look at the extras we're going to paste in, look at the adhesive we're gonna use. There's no reason not to use acid-free adhesive. So if you wanna do scrapbooks, great. A lot of us have books. Um, recently, just in the last 12 months, I discovered not one, but five, five-year journals. So there's only room for like a couple lines for each date of my great 
aunt on my mother's side. What a treasure. I haven't even begun to explore them, but oh my goodness, I'm sure they will shine all kinds of light. I want to make sure that the container I put those scrapbooks in is an acid-free container, that it's a tight lid, that these critters can't get into the book, can't get into the container. Uh, centipedes and rats and mice and spiders and silverfish and other insects um, that may or may not feast on the entity, but certainly will let you know that they have been there by leaving little gifts behind. We, we don't want that to happen. Newspapers, I'm going to be a little uh, snarky here. I don't see a need when someone has clipped maybe 25 years worth of sporting events and box scores and obituaries, um, newspapers were never meant to be a permanent storage medium. We want them to be because we, we value the information that's in them, but they're meant to be disposable at their very core and certainly contemporary. So when you have say a, a great aunt or you or a grandparent or a parent or a cousin has 25 years worth of family in newspapers. There really is no good reason to save the newspaper when you can digitize the clippings, the paper, and come up with a likeness that's pretty darn close to the original newspaper and then preserve that likeness. Um, I just encourage people not to spend a whole lot of time, but to transfer to a more stable medium, newspapers. The opposite with letters and diaries, as I just mentioned about my great aunt's diary on my mother's side. Um, we want to keep those letters. We want to, in a way, um, figuratively feel that person who wrote this letter home from the war front or um, about a disappointment in life or a great excitement in life. We, we want to keep those letters and diaries. So we want to put them in containers that are acid free. They're protected from direct light that are only used when uh, there's a need to use them. We want to pay attention to how we digitize them. Letters should not necessarily live inside the envelopes, but should be unfolded and flattened gently and interleaved with acid free paper in acid free folders. All that's really economical. Store these letters in these acid-free boxes with fitted lids in places where the environment, the temperature and relative humidity are going to remain constant. Um, that is so important. And it's something we can relatively easily do. Um, objects. These two objects were just donated this month to the Genealogy Center. We normally do not collect objects, so don't put that on your list. Hey, I'm going to give my objects to the Genealogy Center. Please don't. Um, but if you want to give us a digital image of them, why did we accept these two? Well, because there was actually a third one, but these two have Calhoun Street, a major street here in Fort Wayne, and a historic park in Fort Wayne. It was a big deal in the day. So these images are pretty important. How do we store objects? Well, we store them like we've stored photographic negatives and photographs from this collection in this acid-free box that you can get from the suppliers that are on your handout. It has a tight-fitted lid. And further, we used a piece of linen. Again, not a rubber band, not a piece of twine, but a piece of linen that's acid-free to basically make sure the lid is secure on the, on the top of the box. You can find all kinds of acid-free storage devices from all kinds of online sites. So have fun shopping. Give yourself an early holiday treat. You know, give yourself, start a tradition. On the Memorial Day holiday, I'm going to uh, treat myself to some really fine acid-free archival boxes to preserve the documents that evidence my family's military heritage. Wouldn't that be a great tradition to start? Digital data, we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about digital data, but if you're going to capture things digitally, at least 300 DPI or PPI, dots per inch or pixels per inch, there's great debate amongst a lot of people about whether you save them as um, TIFFs, JPEG 2000, JPEGs, um, I'm not going to get into the debate. I'm very confident of uh, my opinion based on a lot of other archivists. If I were you, this space is cheap. An uncompressed TIFF image is still an archival standard, so do it. If you want to make other derivatives, fine. Knock yourself out. Even make an old-fashioned bitmap, fine. Don't care. Make sure you capture the original scan as an uncompressed TIFF. All these preservation points are on your handout, so yay. 
have fun exploring. If your partner, spouse, or other person who you share a budget with sees that your budget has shrunk just a little bit, if your reserves have shrunk, well, you can just smile and point and point to this list. Uh, so a quick checklist. Is it clean? Is it whole and secure? How's it going to be stored? What do you intend to do with it? How will it stand the test of time? Are we doing intentional things uh, to stand the test of time? Make sure it's clean and stays clean. It can breathe. Water's not our friend. Ensure that everything you can is pH neutral. Do no harm. Don't laminate things. It, it doesn't need to be shiny. And more often than not, simplest is best. You know, a $5 solution from Office Depot or Michaels or one of the online places uh, can be better than a $1,000 specially made contraption that may or may not work for you. Uh, digitization is a great way. It's a great way to share. So how are we doing? I know I talked at a mile a minute. I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to turn my camera back on and I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think we still have a few moments for questions. Yes, we do. Um, thank you, Kurt. That was very good. Um, people enjoyed it. Okay. Um, we have questions. We, Melissa and I've answered some of them. And if we don't get to your question, um, be sure to send us an email at genealogy at acupl.info. Okay, so some of these are very particular and you may or may not know the answer um, to this very specific question. How does one get photographs unstuck from a photo album? Um, so can, there's... can be very, very difficult. So the, the, the first thing um, you may want to seriously go to the National Archives website or the Library of Congress's website and look at those special sections they have just for us, just for family historians and see if they offer any advice uh, about particulars. What I can tell you is please avoid the quick fix. I wonder if there's some kind of chemical I can put on here that will eat up the adhesive. Well, it will probably eat up your picture too. Uh, so um, that bullet point, a number of slides back, you know, walk, don't run. So take a look at it. At some of these supply places, you can get what are called micro scalpels. And so can you put on a strong pair of readers? Can you get a coin magnifying glass? Can you just carefully look at how the photograph is adhered? And can you tell a difference under some magnification? Can you slowly cut or remove the adhesive away from the photograph? You're gonna do some damage. Um, because damage has already been done hearing that so solidly to the paper. But I would steer away from chemicals. I get a high powered, as high as you can stand, magnifying glass or super extra reading glasses and a micro scalpel and just see how you could carefully pull the photograph away. If you have a choice of pulling and cutting the photograph away, err on bringing some of the acetic paper with you rather than taking some of the photograph off some of the photograph off of the original photograph itself. Um, but it, it's hard to undo some damage. Yeah. Um, I have the similar question actually. Um, Susan has purchased a home um, safe, you know, a document safe for her house that she mm -hmm. was hoping would keep her documents safe due to a fire, uh, in, in case of a fire. But then she said the document safe instructions told her not to put documents in there because it's too humid and humid in the um, safe. And so she's wondering how she should safely store documents at her house that she doesn't want to burn in a fire. Yeah. If she can't put them in the safe. Yeah. That's tough. And I, I don't have a good answer. Um, most of us can't afford any kind of automatic fire suppression system. I mean, you really want your documents in an acid-free box um, because they can breathe and because it, it doesn't become its own like cloud or its own environment where th th there's high humidity. If there could be a safe that breathes um, in our fine book room here at the library, we do have uh, some very expensive fire rated safes that actually have breathing slots on them. 
uh, where air, air can circulate. Um, that's kind of what you need. Most people can't afford it. It's more expensive than those tall gun safes that, that we see sometimes in, in sporting goods shops. So, um, gosh, there, there really isn't, isn't a great answer, Sarah. Um, again, I would look online to see if there is something that is economical that had some ability to um, have the environment inside the safe, the same as the environment outside the safe. So you can make sure the relative humidity doesn't skyrocket uh, and that any off gassing, you know, that doesn't get trapped in there as well. Um, but I'm guessing that most of that's gonna be out of our price range. Um, if your house had a sprinkler system or a powder system in it, which is hugely expensive, um, that would be the, the way to go. Okay, now someone has a, I have my grandfather's pocket Bible from about 1900 with written inscriptions in there. How do I preserve that? Um, I would think in one of the boxes, right? Absolutely. Talking about. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, for um, my money, I, I would try to find, and, and again, have fun with those lists of archival supply places. See if you can get a box that's not tight, not snug against your pocket Bible, but close to the size of your pocket Bible. So it's not rolling around in there. It's not bumping up against the sides, even when you pull it off of a shelf. Um, also, uh, I like the fitted lid boxes that the lid fits down over the top. So the Bible will rest in the bottom, a fitted lid comes over the top. It's acid free. Um, that's what I would recommend. If you can, um, any of the inscriptions, I would see if you can't use your smart device or some other scanner, maybe a hand wand scanner to, to capture those inscriptions so that you don't have to continually bring the pocket Bible out every time you want to show someone, every time you want to refer to what the inscriptions are. Um, capture those so you can lessen the, the use of the actual pocket Bible. All right. Um, how do you handle preservation of something that has already degraded from being folded? My third great grandfather's Civil War discharge certificate was folded up in an envelope. How should this person preserve that now? Um, so as, as you've heard me say, Sarah, and, and another of our colleagues have heard me say, um, we don't do magic here. So there, there, there's nothing magic. There isn't a, a a redo undo uh, button. So that's, that, that's kind of regrettable, um, but we can slow further degradation down. I know it might seem like this is my panacea for everything, but I don't think it's a panacea. I think it's a responsible way of trying to give that artifact extra life. And that is to digitize it. Um, you, you can digitize a really beat up Rev War War of 1812, Civil War, diary, discharge, pension. Um, those papers are really special to us, right? I mean, they carry a lot of meaning and a lot of value for, for our family stories. But if it's already broken up, it's brittle, dirt. I mean, there are all kinds of things that will continue to degrade it. Yeah, if, if it's been folded up in one of those National Archives to kind of... Um, vertical folders or folded up in someone's pocket or who knows. Um, see if you can't gently flatten it, sometimes placing a document in a makeshift humidor. So you're, you're getting some humidity in there and gently undo some of the harsh folds of the paper um, and, then, and then store it flat. Um, if the paper is a little bigger than eight and a half by 11, um, acquire a legal size acid-free folder from on the supply places and get acid-free paper. Once you get it flattened out, you know, store it between those acetic, or that, that acetic document between acid-free pages. And that'll slow down deterioration. And then if you've digitized it, when it does finally deteriorate all the way, you'll have a surrogate. You'll have something you can use and see and share in its place, but no, no magic there. Um, here's a question. I'm not certain um, if I know the answer to this, and you might not either. How do you tell the difference between foxing and mold? They look similar to me. Like, um, I, I would assume old. Great question. Old and I don't, 
I don't have a definitive answer, but um, in my experience, and this is totally experiential and not technical. So again, you'll, you'll want to check me um, on the technical side of things. Foxing usually is browner or and or tanner, and it typically isn't um, um, one spot or section, typically. Now, I've seen exceptions to that, but typically you'll see spots all over a page um, and oftentimes toward the gutter, toward, toward the edges, but, but not always. In my experience, mold and mildew, even if it's brown in color, is much darker, much, much darker, um, sometimes looking black or some of that like dark, it, it's so dark it looks dark blue, even if it started out brownish. So mold and mildew tend to be darker and foxing doesn't smell as much because foxing is acid working on the paper from inside the paper or from something that's been resting on the paper itself. Um, so it, it just doesn't smell as much. Mold and mildew, you pick up that smell right away, even if you don't have a good sense of smell like, like I don't have a good sense. Several people have asked, um, is there a safe way to get rid of a mold and mildew smell? Um, get rid of the mold and mildew. Um, and when mold and mildew are on a particular document, it just depends on how much damage has been done. Um, sometimes it's, it's pretty difficult uh, to, to, to save the original artifact if mold and mildew have really gotten a hold of it and damaged it greatly. There's no way to remove it without further damaging it. Um, so capturing a digital image of it and then using a program to kind of filter out or correct the image so it doesn't show the mold. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, what we're responsible for is, is, is pretty serious. We're responsible for our family heirlooms and artifacts and some things are not easily undone. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned, I think a humidor, but someone's asking more particulars about that. Um, could they check so, that online for like how to, how to make your own humidor kind of thing? Yes, um, definitely. And um, I don't know the specifics of it. I, I consider myself blessed that I've never had to do that. I can gently, and I've gently unfolded a lot of things. Again, I'm blessed that none of them have been like that, that rigid crease where you know that if you press this, it'll just crack. Um, I haven't had any family heirlooms like that, which, which I'm thankful for, but I know a number of people do. So yes, please, please go online as you suggested, Sarah, um, and look at a couple of different articles. Don't just take the first one that you, that you read. Um, there's, I say with a smile, there's a whole lot of cute and a whole lot of crazy on the web. So, you know, um, see if the National Archives has something to say about it. You know, another yeah. entity, Google National Park Service, they have preservation leaflets and maybe they have one that covers, you know, how to um, put some elasticity into a very brittle document. Um, but yeah, I, I would do what you suggested, Sarah. All right. Well, we have a lot of questions left over, and I think we're just not going to be able to get to them today. So um, be sure that if you want your question answered, that you send us an email. And I just put it into the chat again, so you can all see that. And uh, we will try to get you a, a, a good answer to your questions. And do look over the handout, which is very um, comprehensive as well. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll see you again on Thursday for Take part care. two.